So let's begin. Just once again, uh, most of you know I'm Trudy. I'm the founding teacher at Insight LA. And very happy to welcome you to our sitting group this morning. Ran will be moderating for us. Thank you, Ran. He just raised his hand. Um, and Mark, our executive, our illustrious executive director, we're very honored to have you with us. And he's going to be leaving soon. And Mark will be, I mean, Ran, excuse me, will be moderating. And today I want to address the topic of fear and danger. Um, in our practice. I don't know about you, but my palms are sweating these days. Lots of tension before the election, uh, knowing that the eyes of the world are really fixed on our country right now, on America. And for those of you who may be here for the first time, anybody here for the first time, raise your hand. Special welcome to you if it is your first time. I can't see most people's videos. So uh, what we do is we will meditate for about 30 minutes and then have teaching for about 30 minutes and then some chance for uh, some conversation, dialogue, exchange. And so let's sit together, find your comfortable sitting posture. I am back at Jack's house up in San Rafael and very happy to be settled someplace for a while. And hi, Rachel, welcome if it's your first time here. So just finding a way to sit that you can be relaxed, it's really important to be able to just relax and to close your eyes if that helps you focus inside or at least to lower your gaze so that you're not looking out and around at everybody just for now. And I like to take a few deep breaths just to remind myself to relax, just breathing in and out, <sighs> relaxing on the out breath. And once again, <sighs> Just relaxing the neck, the shoulders, letting them drop down. Relaxing the attention and letting our attention drop from behind the eyes where it's usually focused into the body. So we can just feel the body sitting here or lying here, whatever you're doing, whatever posture you're in and gently relax into it. Relaxation is so important in meditation. And today we're just going to meditate with the breath. And if the breath is not a soothing focus for you, for your attention, and just focus your attention on either the sounds of life around you or the sensations in the body, the breath, the sounds, the sensations all happen in this present moment. We don't hear yesterday's sounds or tomorrow's. We just breathe this breath and feel the sensations in the body that are happening right now.
And so you can rest your attention with the movement of the breath. Just gently keeping each breath company as you breathe in and out. Just feeling the energizing in-breath, breathing in the aliveness of this moment. And then with each breath out, just relaxing a little more, releasing any tension in the body, heart, or mind. And just allowing the breath to breathe you, to breathe its own natural rhythm. So the breath, the whole process of breathing in the body peaceful, relaxed, open, and present with however it is for you right now.
And when you notice the mind moving toward the future or ruminating about the past, just gently relaxing, shifting the body back, just maybe a half an inch or an inch. And as you shift the body back into this receptive posture, receiving the breath, receiving sounds, sensations, receiving this moment, there's a sense of just subtle relaxation
I'm noticing any movements of the mind towards that which is stressful or agitating and shifting the body back slightly. You can always take another deep, slow, conscious breath. Just helps to smooth out any ragged or jagged energies to calm down to slow the heartbeat. Just feeling your breath as it fills your body and then releases.
Breathing like this, our minds become more workable. When the mind is wild, crazy, busy, we give the mind something to play with, like a teddy bear. In meditation, the teddy bear is your breath. Our minds are constantly picking up and getting distracted by content, the content of our joys and sorrows and pleasures and pains. So we come back to the breath again over and over like a child 
gets interested in other things, but always comes back to her teddy bear.
And when you're ready, opening your eyes, ding. <laughs> One of the, oh yeah, Rand, can you sound the bell? Do you have your bell? Yeah, I don't know where mine is either. I have had to let go of knowing where my stuff is with all these moves. Um, and if you'd like to keep meditating because we didn't have the bell, please just keep going, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, um, so this morning I wanted to talk a little bit about working with fear and, and also fear in relation to danger and some of the ways that we look at danger in, uh, in Buddhist meditation practice. And, and I chose this because I'm just feeling the tension that is rising in many, many people uh, as the election approaches. And I found myself spending more time on my phone, kind of checking the news and checking. And last night I thought, I really don't want to be doing this. And it's so interesting because this was completely unconscious. I actually ran over my phone this morning in the car. <laughs> it's completely crushed. So there will be um, a phone fast, <laughs> which is really a good thing, I think, for the next couple of days. So uh, in meditation practice, fear is something that, like everything else, we work with. And I wanted to do a meditation with the breath because the breath is actually, um, the breath is actually, a very, one of the most skillful ways to release fear and tension from the body is through deep breathing. And people who, people who have anxiety or who suffer from panic attacks know that this is, uh, this is a really valuable tool. And we began by relaxing and realizing that we can relax. Um, and being able to relax and enjoy the safety of the present moment is one of the greatest resources of our practice. Just whatever is going on, we can, we can relax into it and we develop this skill more and more as we keep going in the practice. And we learn to relax in all different kinds of circumstances because we're learning how to relax with all different states of mind. And what are we relaxing into? Awareness of what's happening, the ability to look and understand and see what's really going on. So I think that everything goes better when we have a choice, we know how to relax. And, and working with fear is not, it doesn't mean if you're scared and we all are frightened by certain things. And in deep practice, fear comes up inevitably. Just the deepest fears, um, the fear of death, for example, what's the deepest fear? And we all have places of really powerful clinging, clinging to self, clinging to being alive, um, clinging to our fears of death and, uh, and so forth. And I, I listened, I learned, um, there's an important distinction between fear and danger. And it can be helpful to sort of tease those two apart and see, okay, not all the things that we're afraid of are really dangerous. For example, being afraid that people won't like me or people will judge my uh, I don't know, my clothes, or um, once I got a comment about looking suntanned, well, it's actually Dr. Hauschka's tinted cream, but, you know, <laughs> those things are not really dangerous. Um, and, but, and not all things that really are dangerous have to be feared. What will happen in our election may or may not be dangerous. We may have a peaceful election where all the votes are counted and the results are respected. Um, 
But even if it's not like that, and even if it gets dangerous, um, we don't need to be afraid. We need to decide what kind of skillful action we can take. People who have been afraid about the outcome of the election are working hard to turn out voters and to educate voters to the views that they hold and feel are most important. So being afraid, when we're afraid, it's really good to look and see what is it that I'm actually afraid of? Like what's the worst thing that can happen here um, in a relationship? It may be that we would lose the relationship uh, but sometimes it's just a social fear. Sometimes it's it's almost always an imaginary fear that we have projected into the future. And some of the fears that we have were formed in us because of dangers or traumas that we faced earlier in our lives or things that our parents were afraid of and just that just transferred into, um, into our conditioning and way of being. And you know, fear is not, fear protects us. It's not a bad thing. It's a way of protecting us. But so being afraid isn't necessarily a problem. It's just something to notice, to be able to even relax into that, into the sensations that come with fear in the body, the thoughts that fear generates. Fear is a wise response to danger. But we can, through the practice, learn to respond to danger wisely without having to be scared, without having to be afraid, or when fear arises, not having to be afraid of that, because the fear of fear itself is actually sometimes more powerful being, you know, because it generates, I'm afraid, and I'm afraid that I'm going to have more fear and, and, and so on. So, where Buddhist practice is going, where mindfulness practice is going, is to, to inquire what is the source of this fear and then to cultivate or develop a wise response to the danger that we perceive. And it might be real and it might not, but danger, uh, fear's function is to protect us and keep us safe. So we can always offer a bow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for protecting me. But I actually don't need you right now <laughs> to be safe. Um, so being able to tease them apart and see some of the difference between fears, the things that we're afraid of, and danger, the actual danger that may be in things. Like um, if you put your phone on top on the roof of your car, um, before you drive, chances are the phone is gonna fall off. And if you suddenly realize that you put the phone on top of your car and you <laughs> um, move forward, you may actually, there is a danger that you may crush your phone. Jack says the shattered glass is a beautiful pattern. I'm not really open to the beauty of it right now, but I am grateful to be without it for a period of time. Anyway, just to be able to articulate to ourselves what we're afraid of and to understand that we can work with whatever it is um, without having to be scared. And I think, you know, I feel very blessed and maybe you've had this experience too of being close to somebody who is dying and who is not afraid to die. Even people who've been afraid of death their whole lives, when death, when especially if it's something like cancer, where we have some warning and a chance to put our affairs in order and say goodbye, and that no matter how much terror there may be at the thought of losing ourselves, losing our life, losing everything we hold dear, when the time as the time approaches, people often let go of all of that. And then they radiate a kind of peacefulness that makes you want to be around them. Um, I felt that with my teacher, Maureen Stewart, as she came close to her death. She never exper 
she never expressed, I won't say she never experienced because I don't know that, but she, we were very close. She never expressed fear about dying. What she felt was going to be a challenge was managing herself and her illness before that time. And she was um, very strong, spiritually very strong and also very sturdy, strong uh, woman. And she taught, she kept teaching right up until, I guess it was just a couple weeks before she died. And she taught the last uh, Sashin or Zen retreat that we had together. She would sit up on her cushions kneeling. And then during the walking periods, she would go into the kitchen and just lie on the floor. That's how exhausted she was. But she did it. It was something that meant a lot to her and she did it. And her ability to face the certainty of her death without fear that she, at least not fear that she expressed. And even in the hospital during the last few days of her dying, she was not afraid. She would slip in and out of consciousness. And what she expressed, I've told this story before, but what she expressed was gratitude. She would be in her kind of semi-coma, and then there would be a sound, you know, a hospital sound, the squeak of shoes on linoleum or something over the loudspeaker, and she would hear that sound uh, and open her eyes and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this moment of experience. Thank you for this moment of awareness. To me, this was, this was loving awareness, really loving awareness. So <clears throat> for all of us, no matter what dangers we may be facing, uh, one friend of mine just uh, went to the dentist and then got a call from her dentist that her dentist had tested positive. And now she needs to quarantine for a couple of weeks and has, and you know, she's close to my age, a little younger, but now she's been exposed to the virus, possibly, we don't know. Her dentist is careful, wore a face shield and I think two masks, but, um, but at our age, you don't want to be exposed to the virus. And so she will spend two weeks being present with experience. And when fear, maybe a wave of fear arises, she will keep her mind in the present. And whatever arises in our minds, in our hearts, our practice is to see it, to watch it, and to let go of it. Actually, let go, I think, just let it be. Just let it be. Let it be where it is. <laughs> let it lie there. Um, yeah like that beautiful Wendell Berry poem, um, The Peace of Wild Things. We don't have to even wanna get rid of it. That's the cool part. We, you know, we don't have to try to push it away or get rid of it, just to see what's there. And whatever we're doing, if we're walking, we're simply walking side by side with our fear. And uh, we don't have to, you know, run into retreat or unless we're quarantining <laughs> to isolate ourselves from the things that frighten us. Just seeing our doubts, seeing our fears arise and pass away, arise and pass away, meeting any, it's, it, this is the way we meet any kind of obstacles or difficulties in our practice. Um, you know, it's just things happen where we run over our phone. Um, <laughs> Better the phone than, than something, than, than a living thing, right? And so trying not to worry about what comes next, but just step by step, breath by breath, just staying present. This is the best antidote actually to fear because much fear is based on uh, predictions about the future that we create. You know, most of us are not facing actual danger in this moment. 
but that doesn't mean that we don't get scared. So the other antidote or help, I think, in um, working with fear is what becomes our ally when we're dealing with things that are challenging or unpleasant, which is impermanence. Understanding that everything is arising and everything is passing away, everything is changing. And this is what is the most helpful insight in insight meditation to, um, to soften the intensity of one's clinging to whatever it might be. It's just like with understanding the fleeting nature of things and even things that seem like they're sticking and coming back over and over and over again and not fleeting at all. Those things are asking for our attention, for our loving awareness. And when we bring attention, our mind will come into more balance. And especially um, when we can remember to relax the body and even if it tenses up right again, just to relax the body and it becomes kind of effortless after a while. It's like a um, figure ground shift instead of sometimes being peaceful and relaxed uh, and really noticing those moments and as uh, precious or pleasurable, uh, we are mostly peaceful and relax. And then we notice the moments of tension and fear and anxiety and worry um, because they're not always there. And you know, you don't have to sit for hours on end to experience this. It helps to do retreats. It helps to set aside time and to meditate as much as you can, but things are going to come and go all by themselves <laughs> anyway. Uh, Jack's teacher the Thai forest meditation master, Achan Cha, he used to say, um, some people think that the longer you sit, the wiser you must be. But I've seen chickens sit on their nests for days on end. Wisdom comes from being mindful in all postures. Your practice should begin as soon as you wake up in the morning and continue until you fall asleep. What's important is just that you keep aware, whether you're working or sitting or going to the bathroom. I mean, think about it. You know, we all have our own natural lifespan. Some of us are gonna die at 50. Some of us are gonna die at 75. Some of us at 90, we don't know, but it's not something that we need to think about or worry about. Um, to quote Achan Cha again, he says, try to be mindful and let things take their natural course. Then your mind will become quieter and quieter in any surroundings, like a still forest pool. All kinds of wonderful rare animals will come and drink at the pool. You will see clearly the nature of all things in the world. Many wonderful and strange things come and go, but you will be still. This is the happiness of the Buddha. Even people who you know, could care less about Buddhism um, like to have Buddhas, maybe in their garden, maybe just to look at because of that um, stillness that does uplift and bring happiness to the heart. You know, and I think that um, this is a teaching that I've taught before because I really like it. Um, the Buddha, when he talks about his teaching, he uses an ocean metaphor, which I love the ocean. So I love the ocean metaphor. And he says, you know, that the teaching he said, it's like, it's like when you walk into the, well, it could be a lake, it could be the ocean, but when you walk into the ocean, it gets very gradually deeper. Then eventually it will drop off. And he said, the practice is like that. It happens, you know, you get gradually, gradually deeper into it, gradually. 
eventually you can go really deep. Sometimes people think of the breath as a beginning practice, but meditating with mindfulness of the breath can take us all the way to freedom, to liberation, to um, the sure heart's release. And I think, you know, we don't notice sometimes, but suddenly at some point something happens and we realize, oh, I'm not looking at the world the same way. I'm not feeling the same way about myself. Uh, I'm not behaving exactly the way I used to. I, I remember working with one young woman who had had a really, really difficult upbringing um, uh, with addicted parents. And she was full of rage and was a very sweet person and didn't want to be full of rage and was very upset that she would rage sometimes at her husband or her kids. And she began to meditate and she, I mean, she also had therapy and, but, but, but the therapy didn't do it. But gradually over time, developing a mindfulness practice that was based on loving awareness, kind attention, self-compassion, she noticed she just wasn't experiencing the rage attacks that she used to. And sometimes it would happen, but sometimes it's okay if it's rare, uh, if it's not, you know, um, plaguing you all the time. And she, yet she couldn't really single out any, you know, any one point where there was some miraculous transformation or epiphany. It didn't, it doesn't happen like that. So for some people it does, but even if you have a huge opening, you know, just everything, and you see the nature of reality and you have an experience like that, I mean, you still are you and you still need to cultivate and integrate and work with all the conditioning and patterns and emotional this is and that's that make up um, who we are or part of who we are. And I know that was true for me. I had a big opening before I even began to meditate, but it didn't change my life. It just made me curious about what is reality actually? What is this that we're involved in here? Um, so being present, allowing ourselves to just stay with this um, stream of life, swimming around with everything, um, understanding that we and everything are just as fleeting and vulnerable as everyone and everything else, whether we're a cow or a hummingbird or a bat or a horse or a stingray or a dolphin or a seal. Uh, we're all being called, at least us humans. I think it comes more naturally to the creatures in the animal realm we're all being called to be present with this ever-changing flow of experience that we call our life. And at this time um, in our country, to be able to interact wisely with what's happening, uh, staying present with experience, breathing, relaxing, letting go of fear, this is really going to help us. So this is what I wanted to share with you today and then open up for some exchange with each other. Um, and I know I'll just add one thing um, in case there isn't really a chance to, uh, to say it to you. And if I'm blinking and stuff, there's a light that's a little bit in my eyes, um, but that's just what it is right now. Uh, another thing that I have found helpful is to look at uh, not just who am I and what am I and what is the danger to me, but in terms of our country, just to look at who are we, who are we really, who have we been. I think the protests around racial and economic injustice have really um, created a crack in the mirror that we might hold up to our country. Um, but it's also helpful some things, you'll find the things that are helpful to you. I know that after the last election, um, Jack and I made a commitment to watch 
the whole series of Oliver Stone's untold history of the United States. And it was helpful to see, oh, there's a through line from Truman to Trump. It didn't just happen, you know, by some random weird uh, twist of fate, accidental. Um, things don't really happen that way. Uh, my phone didn't shatter all by itself. Uh, I've also been, um, I've listened to, well, you know, I was driving up here from LA and, and have a chance to be in the car. I listened to a book called Cast, C-A-S-T-E, uh, by a woman named Isabel Wilkerson. I highly recommend this book for understanding the caste system in our country. She looks at the caste system in India and the Nazi regime, which actually took a lot of its inspiration from the way the United States uh, was treating African-American population and the study of eugenics. I think it was in the 1920s when that was fashionable. Um, totally discredited now, fortunately, but really coming to understand these different regimes and the caste system that operates in our country um, too, it's been really illuminating. So whatever you find, I just think it's also, for me at least, it's an antidote to bind anxiety, to learn, to inform myself, to see things from multiple perspectives. And this is another thing that comes with our practice that is so important. And it's hard for me to be patient um, when I'm talking to people who simply won't do this, but to be able to entertain and, and see things from different angles. Uh, we don't have to be in some kind of moral relativism where nothing's better than anything else, but to just be open to understanding with some, um, some openness to that, to points of view and perspectives that we may not share, but that we also may not have known about before. So this is, uh, I'm gonna stop, I said I would, and now I really will. And Ran will, if you want to speak, I wanna encourage you to, um, yeah, you can raise your hand through the participant function as Bob just did. Um, and that makes it easier for Ran to see and call on you. And when he calls on you, please unmute yourself. And then also, um, I want to remind everybody to practice uh, the stepping forward and stepping back. If you're somebody who is habitually silent, maybe look at your fear of speaking and step forward and speak. And if you're one of the people who talk, well, you know, pretty often in the group, maybe step back and that can make room for somebody who might be hesitating to jump in. Okay, thank you very much, Trudy. Very powerful and timely uh, talk today. And to reiterate what Trudy just said, we encourage those that generally don't raise their hand, please feel free to come forward. And I, I'll pay attention to that in calling. Also, if you don't have video, you can make a note in the chat and I'll pay attention to the chat. So right now we have Bob Poole. I'll lower your hand and go ahead. Thank you, Ran. Uh, thanks, Trudy. Um, I, I wanted to um, uh, go back to something. The last time I shared with you was maybe two months ago or something, and it, it really connected it to what you were uh, talking about today, which was um, about fear. and. Um, I learned something about the relationship of fear and separation and otherness. That sort of made a big difference and, and maybe it will for some other people. Um, you, I was talking about uh, being really just um, uncomfortable with the way I felt like I was participating in the polarization. It was the day you talked about scuba diving and buddy breathing, if you remember that. And, um, yeah. and I felt like I was, you know, I was participating in that and getting, it was right after Justice Ginsburg died and I was angry and pointing fingers at people <laughs> about what was gonna happen. And um, 
And you, you said a couple of things, weren't you? Uh, the, the, the thing that actually turned out to be so important and at the time I didn't get it. I was like, well, how's that help? <laughs> you said, you just pointed out that I had a, lo a longing for it, um, for, you know, for that to be different. And um, like I said, in that moment, I, I didn't get it. But the next day, it was about 24 hours later and I was doing the mindful self-compassion phrases that Jack had recommended to me that day he jumped in for you on short notice. And um, when I said, um, uh, what I said was, may I love and accept my life as it is. And in that moment, I realized that all of those people, those they, those thems, those others that I, were, 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 were my life. Yes. We're not just part of my life. They are my life. Yeah. And it's, it's been different ever since that moment. Yeah. Like I, 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 you know, and in terms of thinking about, um, how to be, you know, how to act skillfully in the future. It's like, I just, I now have a sense that somehow we're all gonna get through this together. We're gonna go into a future together. And I'm not as afraid of that for that reason. They don't seem so other to me, you know what I mean? It was, I mean, I got what they were my life. They seem like me, <laughs> you know, and, um, so I don't know if that would be helpful to anybody else, but it's been profoundly helpful to me. And so I thank you for saying something that at the time <laughs> didn't seem helpful, but turned out to be incredibly helpful. And also what Jack's recommendation to do the mindful self-compassion practices, which have been, you know, I've been doing, it's been very helpful. Well, um, thank you. Thank you for um, working with something that didn't make any sense to you and trying to understand it. And and look what happened. It brought you so much freedom. And, and I've used it, thank you. And I use it as a model for all sorts of things that have been going on for me as I've been doing this kind of revisiting the trauma work. And so there's just a lot of feelings I'm having that are very difficult and strange. And some of them, I can't figure out what they are. And I've just been practicing just honoring that. And there's a lot of longings that have been coming up and I've been doing the same thing. So there's, so thank you for that. I've been using it to apply to all sorts of areas of my life and it's making an enormous difference, I must say, thank an you. enormous difference. And, and with my level of fear in the world too. So thank you. Wow, thank you, Bob, I'm so happy, thank you. Thank you, yeah. And thank Jack for me too, please. Well. Yeah, all right, bye. Okay, uh, Jeffrey, you're up now unmute yourself unmute yourself jeffrey can you hear me yeah you're good hi thank you hi trudy hi. um can't see me very well because i spilled espresso on my ipad this morning and it's <laughs> <laughs> oh hold on. i'm so sorry jeffrey i've got jack's phone let me give it to him i'm so sorry Sorry, his daughter was calling him. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm finding your smile especially comforting today, which is a gauge of the level of my anxiety coming into this chat and uh, into the sit. And I liken it to, you know, I'm trying to be in the moment and following my breath, but it's like if there was a big earthquake and they've indicated that a tsunami is coming in the next two hours and I'm going to sit and everything's okay right now. Everything's okay right now. It's hard. I find it extremely hard to maintain that because the events of the last four years haven't really supported that what's coming next is okay. And uh, it's just a real challenge. You know, I, I, I volunteer with seniors who are struggling through COVID and I'm constantly giving them, you know, mindful and being present um, advice. I'm hoping they take it. Um, but at this moment, because whatever outcome, I, I have thoughts of what could happen. And yes, there's speculation, but I just finding it harder to be.
be present because there's a tsunami coming on Tuesday. I'm curious how you advise when that sort of situation is. Well, this is where I feel like the self-compassion practices are really important where, and, and somebody in the chat asked, how do you access the self-compassion sessions? And I just wanna answer that quickly, which is that you go on the Inside LA website and the mindful self-compassion classes are posted there. So um, I really recommend that course, actually. It's a, it's, it's a way of understanding that self-compassion, self-soothing is not a weakness. It's actually a strength to be able to open to our vulnerability and work with it. And part of what you're expressing right now is immense vulnerability. Um, because, because we don't know what's going to happen. And as somebody pointed out in the chat, we're all reading about people buying guns and weapons and arming themselves because they're afraid um, that they're going to have to, I don't know, kill people because of an election result, uh, but for self-defense. And I can have compassion for that by understanding, well, that to them is the wise response to danger, to buy a gun. Uh, in fact, it's a dangerous response to danger, but that's my opinion. And um, we just do know statistically that people who have guns, more people get hurt when guns are there than not. Um, so how do you work with it when it just feels like too much? This is where the self-compassion comes in because the need then is not to make the fear go away or be intensely trying to make it less but to hold oneself with some um, nurturing, comforting. I mean, I used the teddy bear example. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you have a stuffed animal. Most adults don't have a stuffed animal anymore, but you know, just, just something that is soothing for you. And you know, preferably not something that's also dangerous, like using drugs or alcohol for self-soothing instead of learning some other skills. But it might be to go for a hike in nature. It might be to take a hot bath. And um, it might be to watch something or read something. Like I've noticed I was listening, you know, to this book that's been, it's been helpful to me um, to learn something at right now, something relevant, obviously, maybe I wouldn't study Portuguese, although who knows, some people are moving to Portugal. But um, I think doing something, you know, Angel Angeliki wrote about it in the little um, weekly newsletter in the blog this week, uh, what do you need right now? Just really asking yourself, what do I need right now? And even though you spilled the espresso on the iPad, I can see that there are trees out your window. I can see the leaves. And sometimes what I need is to look at trees. Yes. Or, you know, for me, it's the ocean, but I'm not near the ocean now. So I look at trees or I try to walk in them, among them. Yeah. I think that's what you can do. Um, and if the class is full, we'll put up another class. I see Candace just said the class is full. We'll put up another class uh, because I think it's going to be really necessary right now. No matter what happens, you know, there's going to be unrest for some period of time, at least until the inauguration, uh, because this is going to be a tough one for people. Yeah. Because we are so polarized and so deeply. Yeah passionately um taking care of ourselves yeah. without yeah. Yeah. ignore that there are some potential perils ahead absolutely absolutely Dang. yeah i agree i took lisa's lisa crane's uh, mindful self-compassion last year and i recommend it and maybe yeah. i need to take another one <laughs> yeah so just have to maybe you know um use some of the tools, <laughs> remind yourself to use them. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, Jeffrey. Okay, Rachel, uh, it's your turn. Phil, please unmute yourself. And Hello, everyone. Rachel, Please. wait, I just want to answer one chat question and, be, and then it's your turn. I'm so sorry. Tor, I just wanted to say Portugal is not really a thing. It's sort of a joke between Jack and me because we do have a friend who moved 
to Portugal and she wanted to get away from politics in the US and she's living a very peaceful life in Portugal. So um, that's, I don't know that it's a thing in, in general. Sorry, Rachel, go ahead. Okay, so what I was gonna say is that lately I started like when I have these like, when I have these thoughts that I don't necessarily want, these so-called negative thoughts, I start part of it, in addition to asking myself whether this is real or not, because a lot of the times they're not real. These thoughts aren't real. They're just things I'm making up, that my mind's making up because I'm scared, or as my therapist says, the ego or like the lower part of me, like the lower resonant, the lower frequency part of me is like making this up just so I could, and making this up just to scare me basically and to like pull me hold me back yeah is this a question you're asking oh no 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 it's not a question it's a comment yeah yeah i mean i could comment about your comment if you want yes you can okay yeah um first of all everybody's mind does this so i don't want you to think i mean you may be specially neurotic i don't know you i am no. <laughs> But even if you're not specially neurotic, we all think we're specially neurotic, by the way, just so you know, you're too young to realize that yet, but <laughs> um, we all do. And the thing is that, you know, understanding that there's something called the default network in the brain. And it's, it's really, it's like the brain stem is constantly on the lookout for dangers and threats to our survival or threats to our happiness and so forth. And, um, and so, and we have what actually neuroscientists have called the negativity bias in the brain, which is it's, it's geared toward looking for threats to keep us safe. It's geared toward looking for dangers and the unfortunate thing is it makes dangers up <laughs> when there aren't any real dangers there because it's kind of like, I don't know, wanting to do a really good job of protecting us. So that's where it can be really, it can be useful to just thank your mind. Thank you for pointing out all these potential dangers. But, you know, like you said, most of them are not real. Most of them are just thoughts. And so being able to acknowledge, oh, this is just a thought. It's a thought, which means it has appeared. It has, it's, it's what, is, what is a thought really? It doesn't have any substance to it. It's pretty transparent. And when you see it for what it is, it's usually disappears pretty soon. Um, when you are able to, you know, use your mindfulness to observe the thought as opposed to getting lost in the content of what that thought is telling you. And so for you, that's the key that you wanna be cultivating with your mindfulness practice is observing these thoughts, not making them a story about how neurotic you are or how your lower self is getting control of you. And you know, those, those are more thoughts. And some of them thoughts, some of those thoughts are more useful than others, obviously. But see if you can just observe it and then see what comes next. What's the next one? It might be even worse trying to get your attention. Okay, if that didn't scare you, how about this, right? But you're just watching this process and relaxing your body, coming back to the breath when you can, and then you'll see it changes. And if it doesn't, that's when you say, maybe I need to go for a walk. Maybe I need to have a soak in the bath. If I have a bath, take a shower, whatever, change the channel, you know? Um, and that's part of our practice too, to know what we need and to change the channel when we need to. And yeah, that's part of what I was gonna say is that like sometimes the thought is true, most of the time it's not, sometimes it is. And if it is, I try to like ask myself, well, what can I do about it if it is true? And if there's nothing I can do about it at this moment, then I look for the positives. Beautiful. That's a loving kindness practice. Yes. That's, you know, that's redirecting your attention toward something really good. And that's a beautiful part of our practice. So good for you. Keep going. Keep doing it. Keep coming. I'm glad you came today. Thank you. I'm glad I did too. Really needed it. Good. See, you knew what you needed and you came and it was helpful.
Who's next? Uh, nobody's listed right now. Trudy, anyone else wanna ask? Um, I'm looking on the chat to see if there's anything. I, I don't know how to raise my hand, but. Uh, well, great. You've just unmuted yourself and I did. go for it, Sarah. Sarah, I just wanted to thank you. I don't think I really have a question myself so much other than, um, I mean, this is my second time in your group. I came last week and um, loved it. And my mother's been very sick. So that's been on my mind a lot in addition to everything else happening in the world um and um um and i appreciated what you were talking about today in um in terms of death and thinking about death and the fear of death and um, um well everything but my mother passed away um this morning about two hours ago Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Yeah, just, just a little bit before we started. And, you know, talking about things that we need to do, like being here and, and being able to meditate with you all is what I needed to be doing. And, um, and I'm happy to, to, to be able to be here with you. And um, thank you. I just wanted oh. to... Sarah, I'm so glad you told us because this is such a tender time. Oh, I remember the time right after my mom passed away. So tender. Um, so people are probably going to send you love in the chat, Sarah. So check the chat, take a look. Um, I know I'm sending you love and holding you in my heart during this tender time. Um, you know, we only get one mother in this life. And I have a kind of childlike part of me that still doesn't understand how my parents could have died. It doesn't seem possible. And it's like, seems like some kind of giant design flaw. I liked my parents. I mean, I didn't want to be around them all the time or anything, but I liked them and I missed them. Of course, we won't even mention how could it happen that we will die. We won't go there right now, but, um, but it's a huge sea change in a woman's life. So I hope you'll come back and um, well, you'll do what you feel you need to do. And um, in the meantime, sending you lots of love. Thank you for telling us. Yeah, and look at look at Thank the you. Thank yeah. you for the comments. Kindness. Thank you. Yeah, it's important right now that you have that. So, um, before we stop, I just want to share a couple things with you. One is that I participated in a an event um, organized by my friend Denise Kaufman, who's the lead singer and uh, bass and guitar player for a band called the Ace of Cups. It was called, um, I think it was called People Helping People. And it featured uh, Larry Brilliant, um, very prominent epidemiologist who actually knew of my dad at the World Health Organization years ago. And Wavy Gravy, a clown activist who they are best friends and were part of the uh, founding of SEVA, a foundation to restore eyesight to people with cataracts in Nepal and other places in the world. Larry was part of, big part of the effort to eradicate smallpox through vaccination. Um, and that's why we don't have smallpox in our world. And I wanted to share with you that uh, Larry had had, he has a weekly meeting with scientists and doctors from all over the world, um, hosted by WHO. Our government, by the way, doesn't send anybody to that meeting um, where people share what's happening, their discoveries, what they're learning about COVID. And he said, it looks like by the spring, there will be a safe vaccine, maybe several of them. 
And uh, I just wanted to share that with you because, you know, one of the things that people miss is traveling, for example, being able to get on a plane or go somewhere to another country. We're not welcome in any other country right now. Can you imagine? We are not allowed. We're not welcome. And he said, it will be, and some of you are old enough to remember this, it will be like when you had to travel with a little yellow card in your passport that said, I've been vaccinated against yellow fever and typhoid and you know I've had these vaccinations, to, uh, tetanus, I think. You'll have a little yellow card that you'll put in your passport that says, you know, I've been vaccinated against COVID. And I just wanted to share that with you because especially right now on the brink of a sea change for our country of some kind, um, I think it's good to have some hopeful news. And I also want to encourage you to breathe, to relax, to take good care of yourself. Um, oh, Tora is saying they still use those yellow cards in some places. Yeah, okay. <laughs> to breathe, to relax, to connect where you can, even if it's just, you know, virtually. Uh, with people and uh, and come back because meeting like this, I know it's important to me. I think it's important for all of us. So thank you everybody. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Now we, uh, I, we ordinarily have breakout rooms that meet after uh, a five or 10 minute break where people can have lunch together, where people can connect and share in a small group. But I think today, since we had a missing moderator, we're gonna miss the breakout groups. And uh, I won't ask you to stay for another half hour, Ran. I'm really thanking you for volunteering. Um, but it seems like it might be simpler to wait until next week. What do you, th yeah, let's wait until next week and then we can resume. So, Thank you, Ran. Thank you, everybody, for your practice and your presence. Um, lots of love and blessings and prayers and every good thing for the coming week. So you can unmute yourselves and say hi, goodbye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take Stay care. Well. Bye -bye. Thank, you, Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week. Have a good week. Self care. Good luck. Good luck. Thanks, Trudy. And we need luck. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank yes. you, Trudy. Yes. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy.